All right, let's go ahead and go to our notes, and we are going to start on the top of page 44, and let's review what we said last time. <clears throat> we started out by talking about the power of prayer and fasting, which governs uh, the next um, three or four chapters after that, chapters 5, 6, 7, and basically into chapter 8, we see the power that was released when they were praying and fasting. Uh, Esther, as you recall, prepared a banquet even before she went to go see the king. It was already done. She said, come to the banquet I've already prepared for you. So she was already knowing that the king was going to accept her. And she definitely had God's favor. And her life was spared. And um, he was willing to offer up even to half of the kingdom. It's amazing how sensitive Esther was to delaying things and being patient and throwing even another banquet until the full uh, arrogance of Haman came to bear. And as you know, while that was going on, the, the one thing that needed to be in place was the gallows needed to be built. <laughs> and so while she was preparing for the second banquet, he was out preparing a um, gallows to hang Mordecai. Uh, this filled Haman with pride and indignation when he uh, wanted to kill Mordecai and he could not wait not one more day to see Mordecai that Jew and if you recall the wife and also the friends agreed to have a gallows made which was 75 feet high and we're going to say a little bit about that right now as to what that may have been that he, he uh, actually made um, although it's not sure exactly how that was done. I always take it to be that it was a gallows that people hung on, but other interpreters think that it may have been something different. Well, as you know, there was a supernatural thing that happened, and that was that the king couldn't sleep. He was sleepless in Shushan. I think there's a movie that's called Sleepless in Seattle, and uh, the king was sleepless in Shushan. And we see there the the visible hand of the invisible God as he made it that way. And the, one of the great miracles in the book of Esther is that they could look over 12 years of the king's reign, because this was the 12th year of the king Xerxes' reign, that they could go and send somebody to go pull from the records, and it happened to pull the one record that um, uh, where Mordecai spared the the king by exposing this plot of two of his servants. So that was, that was an incredible miracle that they were able to do that, to go pull that one record. Well, Haman couldn't wait until morning. He had to do it that same night. And uh, again, he walks in supernaturally. It was supernaturally timed that he's coming in to bring Mordecai to be hanged, and the king is coming to have Mordecai honored. <laughs> so there's this clash. And as you know, uh, Haman um, ends up honoring Mordecai and declaring it to everybody. And God has a way of humbling the proud. He knows how to do that very well. He's an expert at it. He also knows how to exalt the humble. And so from here, we're going to go now to the second banquet. <clears throat> As uh, Just before we start reading here in Esther chapter 7, uh, I want to say something that is um, kind of unique on how Christians approach the book of Esther. Most of us have read the book of Esther. We know that Queen Vashti was removed. We know that Esther got promoted. We know there's this bad guy, Haman. We know he made this decree. And we know that in the end, Haman's the one that gets killed and Mordecai is spared. And almost for most Christians, uh, we're done with the book of Esther after Haman is dead. We really are. You ask most Christians, they don't know what chapters 8, 9, and 10 are talking about, especially chapter 9, because chapter 9 is actually a pretty complicated and involved chapter. It's the longest chapter, and there's a lot that goes on in chapter 9. But I want to tell you that... Actually, this is the small event, Haman hanging, 
This is not the big event of Esther. The big event is how are we going to save all the Jews? Esther's been saved. Mordecai's been saved. But now we've got to save all the Jews. And that's what chapters 8 and 9 are all about. And that's where it becomes really powerful, really. I mean, the excitement really takes off in chapters 8 and 9. After Haman, uh, Haman's hanged, we, we, it's almost like anticlimactic. Okay, Haman's gone, but Haman might be dead, but his decree is alive. And it's irrevocable. And so what we're going to see then, I just want to give you kind of where we're going with this, this teaching in chapters 8 and 9, especially when we get to chapter 9, is just, just consider this. Uh, Haman makes a decree in the name of King Ahasuerus, and the Bible calls it, in Esther, the king's command. So there is this decree to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews in all of Persia. Okay, so that's Haman's decree. But it's known as the king's command. And it's out there now among the 127 provinces. In chapter 8, there's another decree that's put out by Mordecai. And it was put in the name of King Ahasuerus. And it's also known as the king's command. And in that one, the Jews also, same wording, they took the same wording that Haman had and put it into Mordecai's decree. They are to destroy and kill and annihilate anybody that attacks the Jews. Okay? Both are the king's command. So you have this one decree from Haman to destroy all the Jews. You have another decree from Mordecai that allows them to be, defend one another. And so both of them are the king's command. Both of them cannot be altered. <laughs> and so that clash of the Amalekite and the Jew, Haman's decree and Mordecai's decree, both being the king's commands, are met in chapter 9. That's where it becomes really powerful. And that, that's, where, that's why chapter 9 becomes so uh, intense because now it's not just Esther's life who's on the line or Mordecai. It's all the Jews in the whole Persian Empire. So chapter 9 then becomes critical for understanding. And, and of course, in the end, we know the Jews win. We know God wins. The Jews win. And the decree to annihilate all the Jews, there's never been a decree like that ever made by anyone in the history of the world. The decree to annihilate all the Jews ends up being so defeated by God and the Jewish people that from that contest, from that clash and that battle that we see in chapter 9, for now 2,500 years, the Jews have had a feast of celebration of that victory. And so what Haman declared for evil, God turned around for good. And the Feast of Purim is to this day, this year, they celebrated the Feast of Purim all over the world. Jews celebrated the victory that God delivers. And so the real power, I think, of the book of Esther is going to be seen in chapters 8 and 9. And they become the longest chapters uh, especially chapter 9, which has 32 verses, as it reveals then Esther and Mordecai make another decree to all the Jews that from now on, every year from now on, on the 14th and the 15th of March, they would always celebrate this Feast of Purim for the deliverance of the Jews. And so that's an amazing thing. To, the, to this day, the Jews celebrate that victory. So... Uh, let's go now here to chapter 7. Let's read it. And uh, remember that when we see Haman hanged, it's not the end of the book. <laughs> it's just beginning, <laughs> as, so, as we say. So let's read it here. Esther uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. It says, So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom. It shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition, 
and let my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed or slaughtered, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, I would have held my peace. Although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? Now Hester, Esther right here real boldly declares it out. And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Then the king arose in his wrath and his rage, the NIV says, from the banquet of wine, and he went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault? The NIV says, Molest the queen while I'm in the house? At, as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. That basically meant, that wording there means his fate has been sealed. He's, he's dead. He's going to die now. Now Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's wrath subsided. Wow, what a story of of a downfall, of a, of a very great downfall. <clears throat> As we approach this chapter, we have to consider this and think about this, that Haman wanted to hang the man who saved the king's life, and he wanted to kill the woman who was his wife. <laughs> that is an amazing thing, isn't it? That Haman wanted to kill the two people that were kind of nearest and dearest to the king at this point, the one who saved his life and the one who happened to be his wife. I think it's kind of humorous, maybe not for Haman, but for us today, that Ray Stedman calls this chapter Haman's Last Supper. <laughs> Just like Jesus had a Last Supper, this guy had one. The um, petition that she had was to spare her life. And her request was to spare her people. So we still see, as we look at these verses, this is now the third time in verse 2 that he has asked Esther, tell me what you want. Tell me what it is that you're, what's all this about, you know? And he assures her, guarantees to her that she's going to get whatever she wants. It shall be granted to you. It shall be done, exclamation point. There's no doubt about it. She's going to get it. One of the things that the narrator, whoever writes this uh, book of Esther does, is he, as he highlights uh, Esther's position as the queen. And um, Haman is not messing with just anybody. He's messing with Queen Esther. <laughs> and if you look at verse 1, uh, Queen Esther in verse 2, it's Queen Esther in verse 3, it's Queen Esther in verse 5, it's Queen Esther in verse 7, it's Queen Esther. And it wasn't that way before. A couple of times they called her Queen Esther, but right here she's really Queen Esther. And just to kind of highlight who she was in the palace. She was the queen. She was the one who was the wife of the, um, of the king. Um, we see something very interesting is that there's two people in this chapter who end up pleading for their life. One is Queen Esther, and in the, the other is Haman. So both of them in this one chapter 
will be pleading for their life. And it's interesting when Esther responds in verse 3 there to uh, the king is he's going to frame it and use the same language that the king said to her about the petition and the request and all that. She's going to include that all in there. And again, we, I just love the way Esther talks to the king about if I have found favor in your sight, if it pleases you, king. And you can even see it also in the way she talks to him about, I wouldn't even have bothered you. If we would have been sold in this, I wouldn't even bother you with this queen, the king. But because there was something far more serious, then she had to bring it up. In fact, the statement that she makes there in, in verse 4 only heightens the seriousness of what she's getting ready to say. Because she says, look, if, if this was just us, all of us being sold into slavery, I wouldn't even have bothered you with that. But just think how serious that is, being sold the whole people group into slavery. And for her to say, I wouldn't even have bothered you with that, it only heightened what was happening, what was really going to happen if they did nothing. So Esther, very wisely, when she says this, we have been sold my people and I. And that's, that's basically in reference to the money that Haman was going to offer. And then she takes the very wording from Haman's decree and puts it in there so the king right away knew what was happening, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated, verse 4. That's exactly what was in Haman's decree in chapter 3, verse 13. And she very tactfully and, but very powerfully, doesn't mention Haman's name. Again, she's very powerful with his, or their words. She does call him the enemy there in verse 4, the enemy. But she doesn't say who it is. She kind of riles up the king to a point where he's just kind of going to explode in anger when he finds out who it is. Uh, Laniac says this, the king's agitated questions in verse 5 reveal his readiness to protect his queen. Someone close to the king was plotting the destruction of his queen. And that is, a, that is, an, is an amazing thing as the king begins to realize, hey, my queen is being threatened with death. And now it's suddenly starting to hit him and, and it's, it's, again, very powerful how Esther at no point ever blames the king for what happened, that she's putting this all squarely on Haman, that he was the one that issued the decree. The king really didn't have something to do with it, although he foolishly gave his signet ring to Haman, and Haman was signing everything in his name. She could have said, said that, but she doesn't. She just leaves it all out for the king to be riled up. So her enemy is now his enemy, and thus he is the enemy, as one of the commentators say. So without any hesitation, um, Esther says who this guy is in verse 6. It's Haman. And man, she, in one short sentence, she called him three names. <laughs> the adversary, the enemy, and he's wicked, he's vile. And that word there in verse 6 there where it says adversary is the same Hebrew word that's in verse 4 where it says the enemy. And uh, in fact, it's the only place in the book of Esther where those, the, that word is found in both places there, the enemy, the adversary. And it's basically a person that um, causes you trouble, is a troublemaker. And when it says the enemy, that is a person who hates somebody else. That's the Hebrew word that was used there, somebody who hates. And of course, that person happens to be this very vile and wicked person, Haman. <clears throat> Oops, I think I went too far. Back one. So now, rather than the queen pleading for her life, <laughs> Haman is now, excuse me, Haman in verse 7 says there he's pleading for his life. So suddenly it, the tables are turned really fast here on Haman and he's pleading for his own life. <clears throat> uh, Job, the commentator, points out that no one could approach any 
of the king's wives, anyone from her harem, even to within seven steps. That was the rule. That was the law of the land. If you got closer than seven steps to any of these women, it was a death sentence for you. It was as if you were trying to take over his throne. And so, of course, when he comes back in and he sees Haman basically almost on top of her, uh, on her couch, that was, that was like the ultimate offense to the king. And so this enemy of the Jews is now being executed as an enemy of the king and not just of the Jews. <clears throat> so basically, we see that he's committed an act of treason. And we see that because it says there in, uh, at the end of verse 8, as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. I don't know whether they put one of those things as they do uh, when they get ready to hang somebody or what, but it, it was sealed from there on. They were just going to have to determine how he was going to die, and Harbona right away offered a solution. But right away, the, the point is he was, he was ready to be killed now. Harbona is, uh, we, this is the only the second time we see him in the, in, the, in the book of Esther. And if you remember, he was one of those seven eunuchs that had access into the very presence of God from way back at the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 10, Mamukim, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass. He was one of these eunuchs that was right there and it was a servant of the king. And he just so happens to remind the king, this Mordecai, He's the guy that spoke on your behalf. And it's, there's this gallows that Haman has made to, for, for Mordecai. Um, and so it's like another perfectly timed thing. Another, we see the act of the Lord uh, moving in here on Haman that he could just bring a guy that knew exactly what to say at the right time. Um, <clears throat> I just want to make a couple of comments here. Apparently, word got out of just how high this gallows is because the people that recommended that was Zeresh, the wife, and his friends. And they were the ones that said it was 50 cubits high. Somehow, Harbona knew the height, uh, the, that it was 75 feet high. He knew that. Somehow, it got around. Now, a lot of people have questioned the veracity of the book of Esther. That there, There's a lot of questions that people have about the book and how it can't be true. How can you build a gallows 75 feet high overnight is one of the doubts that people have about whether this book is true or not. Now, um, uh, obviously, when you're a man as powerful as Haman was in the Persian Empire, you can get stuff done pretty fast when you give an order and so I would think it, it could be done. It may have not have been easy, but it's, they could do it. But the word gallows there is the Hebrew word for tree. It's, you run that word through the, book, the Old Testament, and you find that the word gallows is tree. It's the word for tree. And um, there's a possibility that there was a tree and they just cleared out all the branches and made it where there would be a hangman, hangman's noose there. Um, I personally think it's still a gallows. I think it was built. Uh, Zeresh told him to build it. Uh, but the one thing, of course, we know is what Harbona said there at the end, uh, towards the end of verse 9 there, it's standing right at Haman's house. And that, of course, is where he's going to get hung. And um, <clears throat> uh, we note uh, from our notes that there's already been other people that have been hung on a gallows, not the same gallows, because this was built specifically for Mordecai, but these two conspirators that have come against the king have also been hung already on a gallows, and now Haman's going to get hung on it. <clears throat> the Jewish people, when they celebrate the Feast of Purim, every year, they sing songs, and the songs all rhyme together, and they it talks about the whole story of the book of Esther. And one of the lines of a song that these Jewish people say, 
is this about Haman. He who sought to trap was trapped instead, and he who planned destruction was himself destroyed. And as you read through it, you should, uh, one of these days, maybe, maybe next class I'll bring you one of the songs that the Jews sing. It covers the whole book of Esther. It summarizes it for you all in song. And this is what they say about Haman, that he who planned destruction was himself destroyed. The guy that made a pit ended up going into the pit. We also want to note that uh, something that's true from the book of Genesis and also other places in the New Testament, especially in the law of God, that people are cursed whoever cursed the Jews. And curses come on them. And we see that all the way through the Bible. If people start cursing the Jews, they come into a curse themselves. And it's a very serious curse to be cursing uh, God's people. We know historically, even today, even after uh, Jesus had come and the cross, and we are here as God's people, as Christians, even today, anyone, anyone who has opposed the Jewish people, that people group, that king, that nation has come under a curse. And terrible curses. And you can just look at what has happened in the last century and know that people have been cursed who have opposed the Jewish people. <clears throat> um, there's a truth. It's kind of hard to try to associate a truth from something that's so big like this of Haman hanging and the very gallows that he prepared for Mordecai because it seems so high and pie and sky, but one of the things we can say is what the Bible says repeatedly, and I listed some scriptures here from Proverbs and Psalms and Ecclesiastes, that if we dig a pit for other people to fall into it, we end up falling into that pit. If we roll something, or we want something rolled on somebody else, it's going to come on us. Psalm 7 says, they dig a pit to trap others, then they fall into it themselves. The trouble that they make for others backfires on them, and the violence they planned falls on their own heads. Psalm 57 says, they have dug a deep pit in my path, but they themselves have fallen into it. And may we never forget that. If we wish ill will for others, it'll come into your life. It will. And if you want others to fall, you're going to fall. And you're going to be hurt. And this is what this man wanted. And the very thing he wished on another ended up coming into his own life. It's really a, like what uh, Jesus told us about... Uh, judging others. Remember he said in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 7, he says, don't judge others. Because he says the same measure that you use to judge others is going to be measured back to you. It's a boomerang. Judgment is a boomerang. You throw it thinking you're going to hit somebody and that <laughs> boomerang comes right back and hits you. And so we have to always be aware that this is what happened here. This man's pride caused him to fall but the thing he planned for somebody else ended up coming into his own life. Well, as Brenneman says very accurately, the story is not over. This is where most Christians stop with the book of Esther. Okay, Haman's dead. The thing is over. No, it's, it's actually just beginning here. The story is not over. The narrative has shown the rise and the fall of Haman, but the edict of annihilation is still intact. More is at stake here than just Mordecai's life. Also at stake are the lives of all the Jews in the Persian Empire. And so what we say is, Haman is dead, but his decree is still alive. And so in these next two chapters, it tells us the story of how this decree to annihilate the Jews gets defeated. And so that's what Esther was presenting right here in these first verses of chapter 8. How do we revoke the irrevocable? How do you alter what cannot be altered? And do you remember that happened to Daniel too? Remember when he was with uh, Darius the Mede there in Daniel 6? They got the, those uh, uh, governors and satraps got King Darius uh, 
to sign a, a decree that nobody could pray or worship any god except they could make a, de- uh, a petition to King Darius. And they made him sign it and they sealed it with his signet ring. And then when the king wanted to go rescue Daniel, he couldn't do it. He, he, could, he, he had already signed it. It was his own signature was on it. And so Daniel, he said, I'm sorry, Daniel, your God's going to deliver you. And sure enough, God delivered Daniel. But those, those satraps and those governors went to King Darius and they told him, you remember, you cannot alter this that you've signed with your signet ring. And sure enough, here it was again. It seems like a foolish law, but that's just the way they did it back then, was you could not revoke what the king had said. And he says it again here in the 8th chapter, that I can't revoke what's already out. So, um, but what's powerful then in chapter 8 is when the decree is made by Mordecai now, the Jews now are able to destroy, kill, and annihilate anybody who comes against them. And that's, that's the battle that's fought in the ninth chapter of Esther. <clears throat> All right, let's go to the top of page um, 49. <clears throat> so we got to deal with the house of Haman. And the first thing they do in uh, verse 1 here you see it says the house of Haman and then in verse 2 it says the house of Haman and then you go down to verse 7 and you see the house of Haman. So what happens to the house of Haman? He had a lot of great riches, still had his 10 sons, still uh, had his estate as the NIV calls it. So what happens? So um, the king ends up giving Esther, the very house of Haman, and what does she do? She turns right around in the very next verse, and she gives to Mordecai, the, uh, uh, puts, appoints Mordecai over the house of Haman. So now the very, the very man that Haman despised and hated is now over his whole estate and over all of his riches. And I'm sure he had a lot of money, but it's too, um, it's too late now. He's gone. What we're going to find here in chapters 8 and then into chapters 9 is all of a sudden there is this new concentration of government power put on Mordecai. In fact, Esther kind of is removed out of the scene after this first few verses here in chapter 8. She kind of moves out of the way and Mordecai begins to take command. And uh, we see that, that Mordecai then becomes basically the prime minister. He comes second in command. He basically takes over where Haman was. So not only did he get his house, he also got his position as prime minister over the whole Persian Empire. And um, he's going to issue the decree that commands everybody, all the government officials, to do what he says now. Um, And as we look here in chapters 9 and 10... It says the fear of Mordecai fell on every. Mordecai was great. His fame spread. Mordecai became increasingly prominent. The acts of his power and might, the greatness of Mordecai. Mordecai was second to the king, and he was great among the Jews. So now all of a sudden, Mordecai is highly exalted by the Lord. And really, that is a profound, profound thing that happens here, that the man that was like despised by Haman all the way through, in the end, becomes as a Jew, becomes the highest ranking official in the land uh, other than the king. That is, that is just an amazing story. And again, it goes along with what happened with Joseph in Egypt, with Daniel in Babylon, and now Mordecai the Jew here in the Persian Empire. These Jewish people are raised to these positions of prominence in foreign lands, which goes to show that the Lord is Lord, not over, over Israel, but he's Lord over all the nations. So this, there's a second time now. Remember the first time when Esther approached unsummoned? She does it again here in verse 3. She's not summoned, and she comes. But this time, she falls at his feet. This time, she comes with tears. And, and fortunately, verse 4 says, the king held out the golden scepter toward her. So I don't think he was going to execute her like it was over previously in chapter 4. Uh, five, but nevertheless, the king still had to 
extend his scepter for her to be ex uh, accepted in his presence. And he does that. So she points out right away, you need to counteract this evil, verse 3, that Haman the Agagite has done. And also she says it again in verse uh, 5, Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, she's saying it's him, he's the one that did it. It wasn't you, king, it was him. He's the one that did this decree to annihilate all the Jews. So... <clears throat> Verse 3, it talks about the evil against the Jews. Verse 5, the annihilation of all the Jews. And then she says, this is an evil and a destruction of all my countrymen. This is what's at stake. So again, Haman's dead, but, but I mean, Esther is in tears. The, 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 the decree is still out there. This guy is gone, but his decree is still going to do its damage so really what Esther wants to know, she doesn't tell him how to do it. She's just asking. She's kind of putting it before the king. How are we going to revoke what's irrevocable? How are we going to turn this around? Because it can't be revoked. So she's leaving it sort of in the king's hands. How do we do this? How do we counteract what Haman has done? And what's the answer? The king says, issue another decree that can't be revoked. <laughs> that's, that's the answer to this. <clears throat> so that's when the king says there, we can read it in verse uh, 7. The king Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I've given Esther the house of Haman. They've hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay hands on the Jews. You yourselves, he tells them, go write a decree concerning the Jews as you please, gives them a blank check, in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring for whatever's written in the king's name and seal with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So the king tells them, okay, here's how we're going to counteract what Haman did. You go issue a decree and he doesn't, literally tell him how to do it, Mordecai is going to determine that in, the, in verses 9 and following. He's going to tell these scribes what to write in this decree. Um, <clears throat> as we uh, look at verse 9, we have some dates again. Okay? It's going to tell us very specifically the month and the day when this decree gets issued that's going to go to all of the 127 provinces. Well, it happens to be the month of Sivan, verse 9, and it happens to be on the 23rd day. Well, Haman's decree got issued in the month of Nisan on the 13th day. This is the month of Sivan on the 23rd day, so that was um, exactly 70 days later. Okay, Savan is in June, and it's the 23rd day. So 70 days later, they write this decree. And it's a decree that Mordecai, verse 9 says, has commanded. And now Mordecai is in a position of command. He's telling the Jews, the satraps, the governors, the princes of all the provinces, 127 of them in India, three Ethiopia. He's telling them what to write in this decree. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> verse 9, as you read it, it's a very, 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 very long verse. It happens to be the longest verse in the Bible. Uh, people say that uh, Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the Bible. It's not. Actually, there's a verse in Thessalonians that's shorter than that because it only takes two words. Jesus wept takes three Greek words, so that's not the shortest verse. But this is the longest verse in the whole Bible is Esther chapter 8, verse 9. It's a very long verse. But the bottom line is he's writing it in all the script. Everything that Haman did with his, he's going to do here with Mordecai's decree. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, this decree, it's very important to note that this decree is only valid for one day. <laughs> 
That's it. You can't do anything on any other day. And we're going to find that's true in chapter 9. In fact, Esther is going to have to go back to the king and ask for permission to go kill more uh, enemies because the decree was only good for one day. That was it. It had an expiration date. <laughs> and um, we see that in uh, verse 12. It's only good on one day. And guess what day it was? Well, it was the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar. That was when Haman said that all the Jews were to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. So it's only good for one day. That's it. It has an expiration. And um, <clears throat> so the Jews are only able to attack their enemies on that one day, the 13th of Adar. No other day. And I think in a way... It should have been that way because you don't want it to be like, okay, you, you have months to be able to do this. No, because then the fighting would have gone on for, for, it could have been a bud bath, you know. And you might want to note one thing that was in the decree, and I'm, I'm going to make another comment about it too that I don't have in the notes here. But the very last uh, phrase of verse 11 allows the Jew to plunder the possessions of anybody they kill. So in other words, whoever's fighting them on that day, if the Jew kills that guy, he can take everything that's in his house and plunder it. That, that, Haman gave him permission to do that. And one of the things we're going to see in chapter 9 is every time they had the opportunity to do that, it says it three times, to plunder their goods, it says they didn't do it. The Jewish people didn't do it. They held back. They killed the people, but they didn't plunder any of their goods. So just remember that as we go into ver chapter 9, because he's going to say they did not lay hand on the plunder uh, repeatedly in chapter 9. Now, <clears throat> uh, I didn't include this in the notes, but I wanted to tell you something here about verse um, 11. If you read verse 11, this is the details of the decree uh, that Mordecai issued. And in there, he gives them permission. And it's this way in the Hebrew. I verified it. I verified it with some other scholars and their commentaries. It says there that, that uh, Mordecai gave them permission to destroy, kill, and annihilate. What does it say there? both little children and women. You see that? So, Mordecai gives them permission to be able to do even that. Kill off little children, kill off women, plunder their possessions. We know when we go into chapter 9 that uh, tens of thousands of men are killed. It never says women or children. It says that men were killed. And we'll look at all those numbers next week. But here it says that the, he gave them permission to kill little children and women. Now, if you read the NIV or the New Living Translation, another translation, it twists all the words around. So that it says, if anybody assaults our little children and women, the Jews. And so the wording is twisted and I want to tell you why those translators twisted the words. Because they didn't like what the original Hebrew had to say. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to give you that as a point. Yep. That's why some of these newer translations are yeah. so inaccurate. Right. They see something in the original that they don't like. Right. And they twist it and get it to say the exact opposite of what it says in the Hebrew. It does... In the Hebrew, it says that Mordecai gave them permission to kill even little children and women. Of course, none of us like that. None, none of us here can say, all oh, right, right on, Mordecai. That's what we want you to do. Nobody's going to say that. But that's what the Hebrew says. And that's why we have to be very careful as we study the Word of God not to twist it and get it to say, even if they attack our little children and women, we can assault and, and, uh, and destroy other people. It doesn't say that at all. It says that w the Jews 
can do that to others, not that the others are going to do that to them. And so it twists the whole meaning around. And so the way it has it here, if you have the New King James is correct, they can assault uh, little children and women and also plunder their possessions. So we have to be careful and people want to twist the word of God and get it to say what they want it to say. And uh, that actually has, out of all the books that I've ever studied carefully like this, the book of Esther is one of those books. In fact, in chapter 9, many people have come against Esther because she's going to go and ask the king to do a lot of terrible things. And I want to tell you, she had to do that as a queen in a position of authority, not as an individual believer who needs to do the moral thing. No, she had to protect the Jewish people. She had to protect law and order. She was in a position of authority. And so people look at her, boy, she was a nice queen back there in chapter you know, 5. She was really nice, but now she's the mean Queen Esther. No, it's the same Queen Esther, just... That's what she had to do in order to be ruling there in Persia. Well, let's move on now to, uh, we covered this. Okay, so we get the details of the uh, decree, and we see that it gets written to everybody. And notice very importantly in verse 10 that it's written in the name of King Ahasuerus, and it's signed with his signet ring. And that's going to become important because from then on, it's going to use the word, the king's command. It becomes the king's command. And um, I think I wrote down where those were, didn't I? Yep, right there at the bottom. You see where it says the king's command. Am I? Yeah. And the next slide, you see where it says the king's command, the king's command. Mordecai was the one that commanded it, but it was the king's command. Well, you go back and read Haman's decree, and it says the king's command, the king's command, the king's command. Um, But I think I got ahead of myself. Let me go back here. Sorry about that, David, on the video camera. I said we got it. Plundering possessions. I already said all that. Okay, let's go on to this slide. Okay, so I'm at Esther 8, verses 15 through 17. Sorry about that. So... Mordecai now gets this ring, right? He's got the signet ring. The king gave him the signet ring to do whatever he needed to do. And uh, that was in chapter 8, verse 8. But you'll notice now in verse 15, he comes out, Mordecai comes out of the king's presence, what? With royal apparel, blue and white, a giant gold crown and garments of fine linen and purple. And Leniak is right, you know. Haman may have had the ring, but he didn't have all the symbols of royalty that he wanted so bad. And we see that. Remember when he said, when, how, do you, how do we honor somebody that the king wants to honor? He was telling him, clothe him with all these robes and all. He wanted all that, and he never got it. But Mordecai ends up getting it. And he also ends up with a gold crown on his head. So now... He's honored. He's, he's, it doesn't tell us how they had some kind of ceremony. It doesn't tell us any of that detail. But now he's basically the prime minister. He's second to the king. And um, when they find out that he issues this decree, and when they find out that Mordecai is now in charge, everybody is celebrating. The Jews are celebrating. There's a celebration. And rather than all the perplexity and bewilderment and weeping and mourning that happened when Haman issued the decree, now we see rejoicing, gladness, joy, feasting. And that's going to become the big theme in chapter 9, the feasting and celebration and joy that's going to come to the Jewish people. And once again, just to reiterate, uh, what was Mordecai's command ends up being the king's command because he's the one that sealed it with his signet ring. And so we see that also. uh, Verse 14 calls it the king's command. Verse 17 calls it the king's command. But the guy that was actually making all the commands, verse 8, is the um, uh, Mordecai himself. This is the only reference, according to Baldwin, this is the only reference in the whole Testament where Gentile people end up becoming Jews. And the, the, the celebration 
becomes so powerful and Mordecai's being rushed into this high position broke something spiritually over the whole Persian Empire where before here were people who were going to kill the Jews now people want to become Jews (laughs) and why it says because the fear of the Jews fell on them so can we see God's hand in that for sure and even Deuteronomy talks about uh, chapter 2, verse 25, Deuteronomy talks about God saying, I'm going to put the dread and the fear of you upon all the nations under the whole heaven, and they're going to tremble and be afraid of you. So God's hand had to be on it. This was the invisible, the visible hand of the invisible God once again. And, and that is powerful. And uh, I like what uh, Laniac says, you know, before... It was, you had to keep your Jewishness so secret that even Esther would kept it a secret. And now people want to become Jews, you know. So the whole thing has turned around and, and changed. And now all of a sudden the fear of the Jews has come upon um, the people. And we see that going even into the next chapter where the fear of the Jewish people hits everybody. And they, they just... Man, it, it, in fact, chapter 9 ends up being a complete slaughter uh, where tens of thousands of people get killed and it doesn't report any of the losses among the Jewish people. But uh, there's a complete slaughter for the Jews and uh, the people end up actually fearing the Jewish people. And, um, of course, a lot of them became uh, Jews themselves. So anyway, a great turnaround of events here for the Jewish people. And we again see the hand of God on them. All right, so next, um, read chapter 9. It's actually kind of a difficult chapter, so we're going to have to lay it out because there's so many things take place in that chapter. And sometimes it looks like they're just repeating themselves. But it's a long chapter. It's 32 verses. But we're going to see the establishment of the Feast of Purim. And we're going to see now these two decrees come head to head both from the king, and they're both going to be on one day that this battle takes place, and we're going to see who wins. All right.